missing and murdered indigenous women, their cases never solved. In Northern California's most rustic landscape, behind this redwood curtain lies a dark and devastating mystery. I got a phone call one day that my daughter was missing. Mothers, daughters, and sisters all vanishing into thin air. It's not safe. I could disappear and nobody would know. Resources are scarce. She was worthy of a search. She's still worthy. The tribe has essentially been told, well, you can't have jurisdiction for certain things. The county's in charge of that, but we're not gonna give the county any extra money. We explore California's dark past that makes these tribal communities so vulnerable. You're looking at the massacres of which there were a number. You're looking at boarding schools and you're looking at indentured slaves. And a look at the efforts to right those wrongs, starting with an entirely new justice system. They fought for me. If they didn't, I would end up in prison again. I'm Elizabeth Cook. We're shedding light on an unseen crisis here in California, the growing number of missing and murdered indigenous women. Our state has the largest Native American population in the United States, but women living on these tribal lands are especially vulnerable. 84% of them experience some form of violence and are 10 times more likely to be murdered. And because there's no database for these types of cases, there's no accurate count on just how many women have vanished. Among the missing, Emily Risling. She vanished from the Yurok Reservation in Northern California. And a little known federal law may actually be hindering the investigation into her case and many others. <laughs> Alongside the Klamath River, near the side of a road, there's a weather-beaten flyer. On it, the face of an indigenous woman, 33-year-old Emily Risling. She's been missing for more than a year. I think the most heartbreaking thing is that you just may never see that person's face again. That's she had everything going for her in the right direction, and the thing started falling apart. Emily's parents, Gary and Judy, are heartbroken. Their daughter vanished into thin air. Her case is growing cold. It's really simple. We want to know what happened, where she is. What we do know. Em. Hi. As a child, Emily was a ray of light, full of joy, so much love, so much potential. Hey. From an early age, she embraced her native identity. She loved her culture. She loved her family. The straight-A student had lots of friends and went to college on a scholarship. Then her world began to crumble. A boyfriend violently abused her. She began to use drugs. And so this young woman who was so bright, so capable, so, you know, the world was her oyster, she kind of became a different person. Her parents uh, told me after the birth of her second of child, system. Emily developed postpartum psychosis. She was arrested for igniting a fire in a cemetery and put in jail. Her parents hoped she would finally be forced into treatment. The DA's office, her family, all were against letting her out, and they did. A few days later, everything changed. So give us some perspective of where we are. So we're on 169 at Pequon Bridge, and this bridge is the last confirmed place that we know Emily was at. Greg O'Rourke is police chief of the Yurok tribe. The bridge is on Yurok land, more than two hours from Emily's home. He believes she got here by hitchhiking. Here on the bridge is where we can confirm multiple witnesses. But if a major crime involving Emily occurred here or anywhere else on tribal lands in California, the tribe has no jurisdiction to investigate it. So who's in charge when someone is murdered or goes missing on tribal land? The answer to that involves a dark chapter in federal Indian policy. It's known as Public Law 280. So it's taken away a tribe's ability, or at least in theory, you know, their, their, their sovereignty to be able to have their own people, have their own law enforcement and uh, investigate crimes on the reservation and put that onto the state. 
Congress passed the law in 1953 without the consent of tribes. It greatly enlarged the power of certain states, including California, to handle major crimes on Indian reservations, but with no additional funding. The sheriff's office has jurisdiction on tribal land. And so you're having government come in and telling uh, a sovereign nation of what crimes that we're going to enforce on their land. This is our, uh, our booking area. William Hansel is sheriff of Humboldt County. He sees this law as a roadblock to solving cases. When there's no trust involved, oftentimes we can't even get our foot in the door to, to have an interview. That said, Emily's family is angry. They feel law enforcement has given up. You guys have been accused of not doing enough. And right. you've got the money, you've got the resources. Where are you when it comes to these cases? Yeah. So I think a lot of things have changed over the years because a lot of times I think where there was jurisdictional boundaries, a lot of times there was finger pointing. Who's going to investigate this? Who's going to follow up with this? Both the sheriff and local tribes are dealing with the lack of money and manpower in a county the size of Connecticut that's home to 11 tribes. It's also way off the grid. It's an extremely remote area. You know, when people talk about rural, then there's us. <laughs> the Yurok Reservation itself is 85 square miles. Easy to see how Emily could just disappear. I think the system failed Emily all along. All Judy and Gary have left are memories, birthdays, holidays, and her smiling face. Emily's son, their grandson David, wants to know. Can you take me, Grandpa, to go down and look for my mom? And if we can find her, we'll find her. And he looks at me and he goes, well, what happens if we can't find her? I said, David, we we'll just keep looking. Just this year, California's Feather Alert was implemented to help bring women like Emily home. It works a little bit like our Amber Alert system, where the CHP will put out immediate information about a missing indigenous person if all available tribal resources have been exhausted. So why are these women so vulnerable? Well, to understand that, we may have to look to California's brutal treatment of indigenous tribes in the past. One example, children taken from their parents and sent off to boarding schools. Here's a picture from 1881 of a group of newly arrived children. Seven months later, another photo with all signs of their native culture erased. Coming up after the break, how the trauma of the past is still felt in indigenous communities. You know, things happen to us as a result of an invasion and a lot of bad behavior. And we took on some of that behavior. Images of headstones in an overgrown field, many of the names completely faded away. They represent the 65 indigenous children who died while attending a boarding school in Riverside. Their remains far away from their homes. Indigenous children were often taken from their parents and sent off to boarding schools to be assimilated into white culture. And even generations later, the trauma is still felt. Redwood canoes are once again gliding on the Klamath. They're actually getting a glimpse into our way of life before colonization. For Yurok tribal leader Philip Williams, it's a way to connect to his ancestors. It's important that we don't lose this culture. For thousands of years, these hand-carved dugouts traveled the river. The Yurok tribe revived the tradition. But it's not just the canoes that nearly went extinct. It's hard to accept the fact that there was a society that wanted you gone. During the gold rush, government officials funded a campaign to slaughter California's Indians. In just 20 years, 80% of the population was wiped out. Some say this contempt for native life continues to this day. Some people out there think we should just die and go away. And that this disregard is now reflected in the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women. For this tribal leader, it's personal. I lost my daughter five years ago. His daughter Tara went missing and was later found dead near her crashed truck. He says he'll never know the full story. We've been losing 
people all the time. Unsolved mysteries appear all the time. As for the historical wrongs, they include more than massacres. There was a systematic attempt to erase traditional values, behaviors, and beliefs by forcing Indian children into boarding schools. Forget your culture, forget your life, and become assimilate, become a, a white person. A recent federal report reveals that from 1819 through 1969, the U.S. operated more than 400 Indian boarding schools. Twelve were in California. Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families and communities. Children who resisted assimilating were often punished with whippings, solitary confinement, or starvation. So what do these wrongs have to do with the missing and murdered women? You know, things happen to us as a result of an invasion and a lot of bad behavior. And we took on some of that behavior. Abby Abenanti is the chief judge of the Yurok tribe. She believes the traumatized children, some who were enslaved by wealthy landowners, passed their pain, suffering, and coping mechanisms onto the next generations. Many of them would run home but they came home having not been parented and with a lot of bad habits because they were beaten and whatever. Habits including substance abuse and domestic violence that can lead to mental illness. The challenge is how to break this destructive cycle. So this is Chanuk acorns right here. Many believe that effort includes reconnecting to traditional values and beliefs. Do you feel like when you gather acorns, you're in some way connecting yourself to your grandmother? Oh, absolutely, I do. Tara Lynn Ipina shows me how she gathers acorns, a traditional food okay, still so used by indigenous know, tribes. Okay. Tara Lynn's grandmother was murdered. Recognizing the trauma is helping her break the cycle for her daughters. When we're talking about it, talking to my kids about it, they didn't know because I didn't talk about it. It's so painful. For Philip Williams, reclaiming the Yurok heritage is one step closer to healing. But he knows it won't take away the pain from those still waiting for resolution. My daughter was found. I can't imagine what it would have felt like if she wasn't found. I have closure. I buried my daughter. And they don't have that. So what exactly is happening to these missing women? Well, we'll hear from Attorney General Rob Bonta coming up why he says the answer is complicated. You know, some, uh, tragically, are, are being murdered, are, um, kidnapped, uh, trafficked. This past week, the first ever commemoration at the state capitol to honor and recognize missing and murdered indigenous people. Tribal members from California and beyond attended. Among the speakers, Assemblyman James Ramos, the first Native American to serve in the state legislature, and State Attorney General Rob Bonta, who pledged his commitment to work with the tribes on this issue. We are joined now by California Attorney General Rob Bonta. Thank you so much for being with us. You know, there's so much unknown as to what actually is happening to these women. I'm curious, what do you think is happening to them? I don't think it's one thing. I think it's probably a, a variety of different outcomes and um, unique incidents. You know, some uh, tragically are, are being murdered, are, um, kidnapped, uh, trafficked. Um, some are, um, you know, dying in, in, in other types of ways to, for those who, who are, are passing away. Um, some may have drowned, some may have overdosed on drugs. And so I, I think it's, it would be wrong to focus on just one type of possibility. It's important to keep them all on the table. You know, Public Law 280 has made it very difficult for these tribes to prosecute and investigate these cases of missing women. I know your administration has um, made investments and initiatives to try to make up for what Public Law 280 takes away from some of these tribes. Do you see a scenario where the government puts an end to this law that seems to be doing a lot more harm than good for these different indigenous tribes across the nation? You know, to be clear, Public Law 280 was passed by the federal government, not, mm -hmm. not the state of California. The way it has uh, actually played out in on the ground is that, that the state and, and local um, law enforcement have had 
uh, a, a significant role when it comes to criminal enforcement. And uh, based on where the tribes are and, and some of the um, adjacent responding law enforcement um, departments, uh, they tend to be in, in some places that are uh, often more rural, um, have smaller uh, uh, law enforcement departments, have less resources. And that leads to uh, sometimes a response times that are not what uh, we all would hope for. Uh, that lies uh, very squarely in the court of the federal government. On April 22nd, you announced a DNA collection program where people could voluntarily give their DNA that could help not only in investigations, but also identifying some of these missing women. I'm curious, what was the response to that program? It's been a positive response so far, and you know, not without challenges that we want to make sure we address head on. We need DNA samples from family members. Um, it could be a, a sample of the missing person's hairbrush or th th that could have their DNA on it. It could be the, the DNA of a, a parent or a sibling. And then we can match that against a database of DNA of, of folks that are unidentified. And we want to absolutely emphasize and, and say without um, any doubt that any DNA provided will only be used to help identify missing people. It won't be used for any other purpose, including for criminal investigations. It, the DNA will be destroyed once the missing person has been identified. What do you want to say to the families of these missing women who feel that they have been overlooked, ignored, and they just want closure? They want answers as to where their loved ones are, and they're looking to you for those answers and any kind of help. What do you want to say to those family members? I want to say I see you. I value you. I am so sorry for the, the pain and the anguish. Uh, that you are suffering, that you're enduring, and that we will take action uh, with you uh, uh, in mind, top of mind. We will prioritize your challenges, your concerns, uh, your worries, your anxiety, your pain to help get you the answers that you deserve. An emphasis on healing and rebuilding lives. Up next, we'll take you inside the tribal courtroom that's taking a new approach to justice. I don't think humans respond well to punishment and consequencing. I think they respond well to the, our approach. How does a community move forward from centuries of mistreatment? Part of the solution for the Yurok tribe is a brand new justice system, all focused on healing and tradition. They've helped me change my life in so many ways. His name is Lawrence Orcutt. Well, I used to be, like, to say it bluntly, um, a criminal. With a long rap sheet that includes drugs, domestic violence, and DUIs. So when Orcutt got arrested again, he was on the cusp of losing everything. Then he got a dose of tribal justice. They fought for me. Um, and. If they didn't, I would end up in prison again. Okay, we'll hear the case again in two weeks. Welcome to the Yurok Wellness Court. I'm glad that uh, you guys, you know, were able to get her into treatment. The court uses a holistic approach that draws upon Yurok teachings, activities, and rituals. The goal? To provide a path to mental, physical, and spiritual healing. Did you connect to that in that way when you were here in this wellness court? Um. There is a lot more traditional aspects to it. Um, it's not, uh, we're gonna get you in trouble or put you in jail if you mess up. It's more like, let me help you. And that, that, that's huge to me. The program was created by this woman, Yurok Tribal Chief Judge Abby Abenanti. As to why a different approach was needed? I don't think humans respond well to punishment and consequencing. I think they respond well to the, our approach. Judge Abby is highly qualified to know. Born in San Francisco, she grew up in Humboldt County. Female tribal leaders insisted she become an attorney. That's the first lesson. You cannot win an argument with three old Indian ladies. So I went to law school. <laughs> Abenanti became California's first Native American female lawyer. She spent 20 years as a commissioner for the San Francisco Superior Court. When she returned home, she saw a community overburdened with domestic violence, substance abuse, and mental illness. So all that behavior came from somewhere. And once you understand that, then you have a, 
a fighting chance of getting on the other side of it. That means recognizing real harm was done by Indian boarding schools, indentured servitude and massacres, and that these traumas are passed down as destructive behavior within families. The question? How do you want to stop this? Do you want your children to do this? Or do you want to stop it with you? Many believe this history plays a role in the crisis of the murdered and missing indigenous women. I think that people who don't interact with tribal sovereign nations and tribal governments um, frequently don't really understand how they're treated differently under the law. Rosemary Deck is prosecutor for the Yurok tribe. Her office recently hired an investigator who will only focus on cases involving these women. The U.S. Marshals are now also involved. The unseen are finally becoming less invisible. I think that they're starting to pay attention and it's too late but it's better late than never. As for Lawrence. I like being a dad. <laughs> he now owns his own construction company, has plenty of work and is closer to his family. It's the judge. Sure, how are you? Our day ended with a chance encounter. Thank you. With the judge who oversaw his case. <laughs> building a bridge from the past to the future with a little help from tribal healing. Now, many of the children whose mothers are missing or murdered end up in the foster care system. And now Judge Abby Abenanti is also working to protect them from being abused or going missing themselves. In California and in many states, for instance, when a foster child does not come home at night, nobody is notified. There's no alert system. So you're just lost. And a lot of trafficked children come out of the foster care system because it's fairly easy to do that. So we're working on trying to address those issues with the state legislature. And that legislation calls for more oversight from the courts and an alert system that would keep tabs on foster kids who don't return home. The faces of these missing women motivated us to tell their stories. And as we wrap up, we wanna thank the members of the Yurok tribe for welcoming us into their homes. We'll have more on this unseen crisis on our website, kpix.com. Thank you for joining us.